So it sounds like uh, the gang's all here. So I will remind everyone uh, that this meeting is being taped. And I will ask for a roll call vote uh, to open our meeting. Kevin Estes? Here. Myra Sweet? Here. Nick Cyclopatis? Here. Helio Rosa? Here. And Kevin Mello? Here. So we'll begin the Town of Dartmouth Planning Board meeting of October 27th, 2024. Um, we have a continued public hearing for number one. It is a definitive uh, OSRD special permit for a subdivision entitled Goulin Farm. And its address is 482 Fisher Road. Um, Steve Giosa is in the public. Uh, I believe he's here to speak on this. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, for the record, Steve Giosa with SciTech representing the applicant this evening. Um, as the board members probably recall, this is a seven lot OSRD um, project that is being put forward, uh, located on the east side of Fisher Road, uh, just to the south of White Oak Run. Um, if I can share my screen, I will yes, go through a couple of the, the changes that we discussed at the last meeting. Um, and... Okay, so this is the overall subdivision plan. And again, for orientation, north is to the top of the drawing, Fisher Road here on the west side of the plan, a small cul-de-sac being created, seven lots surrounding the subdivision and um, a open space parcel situated on the east side of the site, which encompasses a little over 12.8 acres of land. And when you look at the zoning, we're obligated to have a minimum of nine acres, um, nine and a half acres actually for this site. So we actually have more designated open space than it is required uh, under the zoning. So we think it's a good plan from that standpoint. And we do have our drainage system, which will be isolated on a separate parcel of land here uh, on the property. And the board members recall at the last meeting, there were, I think, two items that came up in discussions with the neighbors. One had to do with well and septic system locations on the abutting properties. And the other item had to do with preserving some form of buffer space, uh, protecting or creating a no disturb zone between the uh, proposed development and uh, the abutting lands, both to the north uh, and to the south. So on the first issue, the septic systems, uh, we did contact the Board of Health, got, got all of their as-built information on wells and septic for the properties that surround the site, including those on the opposite side of Fisher Road. Uh, you'll see that uh, the gentleman had pointed out his well and septic were kind of offset on his property closer to our boundary line. So we have shown the existing well and leaching field, as well as the 100 foot radius for uh, the abutting well here. The wells and septic across the street, the septic for the corner lot here is quite a bit further. It's actually more than 200 feet away, so it doesn't really show. Uh, the well directly across from lot seven is located here and the septic to the rear. So you can see the 100 foot buffer zone just nicks the property in this location here. And then on the north side, um, we have one well that has a 100 foot radius that extends onto the property, but we've located the septic for the next property back and their well is actually located several hundred feet away. So we have identified all of those features that potentially impact the placement of wells and septic systems on the subject property. And we're comfortable with that information that we have sufficient land to place our septic systems here as we originally contemplated uh, close to the road on all seven lots. And we would fit the wells for say this lot seven in this location, lot six in this location, lot five generally here. And then the rear of these lots is where the wells would go for each of these lots. 
and the septics would all be in the front. So we think it all works fine and it satisfies that particular issue and hopefully addresses that concern. Um, the other item that was brought up was uh, had to do with creating some level of buffer zone or no disturb zone between the development and the adjacent lot owners. Um, we did take a look at what we could restrict on each lot without adversely impacting the lot values. And the owner and I came up with a plan to create a uniform 20 foot no disturb zone, which would be it's demarcated on the recordable plans here and here with the cross hatching. So those would be strips of land where no cutting of trees, um, building of sheds or other structures would occur. So this would remain natural, this would remain natural, and it still preserves enough room for our wells, septic systems, house placement, and a reasonable lawn area for each dwelling. So. We hope that addresses that particular concern. You'll see that we didn't create that designated no touch zone here because this is open space land. So there's no proposed activity in this strip of land here. So that's a natural buffer that will remain adjacent to the land here. And then the open space wraps all the way around to this location. So again, you'll see the, the designated no touch just running behind the buildable lots and the homeowners don't have the right to go in and do clearing here. Because we're showing it on the recordable plan, they're purchasing their property, their property uh, deed will refer to this plan, and these restricted zones uh, would be highlighted in their deed. So we think that makes it very clear to any potential buyers um, that we have areas that are that are labeled 24 wide, no disturb zone, and, um, we think that addresses that particular concern. Um, we did look at um, the design of the project with uh, the DPW. As you recall, the DPW had a number of comments. Um, and basically what ended up happening, we added some additional elevations along the roadway, um, reworked some details, construction details for the project, and we've also recalculated the detention pond uh, based on the comments received. And it actually, the pond footprint didn't change materially. It actually got a little bit smaller based on the comments we received. Um, and um, the extra detailing on the road will ensure that the pavement is crop properly constructed. So we have spot grades that we've added around the cul-de-sac in particular uh, to assist with the paving contractor. There were some uh, construction details that were modified uh, that we did uh, agree with DPW on. And after filing the revised documents, um, I reached out to Paul Duart at DPW, uh, met with him last Friday for about an hour and a half. Uh, we went over all the plans. Um, he talked about a couple of other minor uh, calculation adjustments he wanted us to make. And the reason for that is uh, there's a little bit of a conflict between the town's subdivision regulations and the stormwater regulations relative to um, runoff mitigation, limits of watersheds, those types of things. Um, so we've agreed to uh, follow the more current uh, stormwater regulations, which is what Mr. Duart uh, recommended. And so there'll be a couple of just very minor grading changes here in the detention pond, but no expansion. Uh, there'll be no change in any property lines. Uh, so again, minor technical changes on the street. We originally had two catch basins on the street. Uh, Paul indicated that if we went to a single double catch basin, we could eliminate this one section of pipe and this one catch basin here. And that would simplify the drainage a little bit. It would just change the detail on how this particular catch basin is constructed, but not change anything materially on the plan, the layout, house placement, driveways, or any of the other uh, critical features. So uh, with that, we're, we're gonna have a couple of very minor edits to finalize things with DPW, um, but we think that we've addressed all of the, the major items already and be looking to see uh, if the board is comfortable with the plan at this point.
I'll break the ice and share with the fact that the uh, presentation was more than detailed. Obviously, you're the expert, but uh, I don't have any questions. Anyone else? No questions for me. We have a letter from the Board of Health. Have you seen that letter? Uh, yes, I have. Um, Would you like to address that, please? Oh, sure. Um, so under Title V, there is a requirement that when you're placing septic systems on a piece of land, you're allowed to apply up to um, basically one bedroom for every 10,000 square feet of land area you have. And that's trying to control the nitrogen loading um, in the environment for these lots. So as you can imagine, these are all smaller footprint lots than what the current zoning uh, requires. And so we have to do one of two things. We either have to propose uh, nitrogen removal septic systems or in the alternative, DEP allows what they call a nitrogen aggregation plan to be put on record, uh, restricting the overall property um, to a certain number of bedrooms that does not exceed that basically one bedroom per 10,000 square feet of land area. Um, when you add up the surface, and these are probably all gonna be four bedroom houses. We're not looking at doing anything bigger than a four bedroom. So if you took the worst case, you got seven four bedroom uh, dwellings being proposed. Um, you need 10,000 square feet per bedroom. And if you add up the land area, the lots don't occupy the full 40,000 square feet per septic system requirement um, under Title V. So the way to uh, address that concern under Title V's regulations is to put this restriction on an alternate piece of land under the ownership or control of the applicant. So in this case, what we would propose to do is have the entire 19 acres of land be uh, restricted with a, a nitrogen aggregation restriction we have 19 acres well over the, um, the square footage or acreage that we would need to restrict. And that would address that particular concern raised by Mr. Michaud. Now, he's raised one question. He says, well, does encumbering the open space land uh, constitute a, a lien on that property that is a, goes contrary to the zoning ordinance? And we looked at that. I don't believe that's the case at all. I think they're talking about liens relative to financial liens, uh, those types of encumbrances. The OSRD regulations allows drainage easements and other easements on the open space land. So I don't believe that that is a restriction. But let's take the worst case. Let's take Mr. Michaud's uh, point that we can't restrict all of the open space because the regulations want no encumbrances on the land. We could actually restrict, I think it ends up being about one acre of the open space land. I think it's maybe an acre and a half out of the 12 and a half acres we're creating and have that be part of the aggregation plan as well as the seven lots. And we're well above the minimum required open space land with no restriction, we would be at 11 acres of open space versus the nine and a half that is required as a minimum under the zoning. And we would still meet the aggregation requirement of restricting enough land to have four bedroom houses in all, four, all seven lots. So we think either option works. He would like to, when we get to that point, uh, have town council review that. Uh, particular restriction. And those are the two ways we can, well, there's actually three ways we can work around it. I think it can encumber the entire open space. If town council says no, we can then only encumber an acre and a half of the open space and still leave it as open space. It's just that one and a half acres would be um, encumbered and we would still have more than the minimum unencumbered open space required by zoning, or we could go with nitrogen removal uh, septic systems, and that would address the issue with no aggregation uh, requirement. So uh, we think in, on all cases, in all three cases, the plan meets those requirements, and we'll work with uh, Mr. Michaud and Town Council when we get to the Board of Health phase. 
Well, Steve, do we have to put something like that on the plan? Should it be on the plan that? Well, it, I, here's what I would suggest, that we have to do an open space uh, covenant. Right. I would I would put it in the covenant, let town council, which I think you normally would do, is pass that by town council before you accept it. Have town council review the covenant, make sure he's comfortable with that, and um, that should address the issue. If um, town council says we need to only restrict a small portion of the open space, we would show a dash line on the recorded plan. I would probably go to um, this drawing here, lop off an acre and a half here out in the back, and that would become our aggregation area. And then the lots would all be deed restricted as well. That document gets recorded at the Registry of Deeds, and that would address that particular issue. So at most, it would add a, a line to the plan, lopping off an acre and a half. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think that the open space as it sits today uh, can all be restricted that way. I think it's actually in... Uh, the town's best interest to try and restrict it that way because the open space bylaw does allow some activities on the open space, which could add nitrogen to the environment if, if left uncontrolled. So the, the intent of the aggregation requirement is to restrict that nitrogen impact. Um, I think restricting the whole open space makes the most sense. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, I have another question, Steve. Uh, again, the fire chief has come back about um, putting in um, the, those um, cistern. The, thank you, cisterns yeah. for, for fire. And you know, I would like the developer to reconsider. Yeah, he's looked at his economics. It's a fairly pricey addition to the plan. Um, We'll obviously have to defer to the board. If the board puts that as a condition of approval, then we'll have to address it. Um, but um, where the regulations don't mandate it, um, we think it's, yeah, we know it's a nice to have item to add on, but it is not required by NFPA or subdivision regulations at this time, um, especially for a smaller project. I, again, we've seen their use um in towns like westport westport does require it and typically you're dealing with larger subdivisions when you're putting in the cistern so you can disperse the cost between all the lots um it, it does make it more economical so um we'd prefer not to but we'll defer to the board in your decision well steve you do a lot of business in westport uh, do they have a restriction on the subdivision of how many lots before you put a cistern in? And I think Dighton has this too, if I'm not correct, uh, if not mistaken, because yeah, um, I, I I don't want to say for sure what Westport's specific regulations okay. are. I know that I just we've done some smaller subdivisions where we don't have cisterns. I just don't know what the the lower number is on the cutoff. I don't want to say the wrong thing. All right, thank you, Steve. Anyone else on the board? Just uh, one quick question, Steve, for curiosity's sake. What is the the, the distance between Fisher Road and the, the center of the cul-de-sac approximately? So from the layout line of Fisher Road to the center line of the cul-de-sac, it's about 300 feet. Thank you. I'll go to uh, I'll go to this plan and I can get you a closer number. So we run a baseline which measures the distance. So this zero plus Kevin, somebody. Is, is someone talking or? I'm not talking. <laughs> okay. I was hearing something there. I did. Um, <laughs> so center line here is in the middle of Fisher Road. 300 feet is to this point here, but you'll see the zero starts here. We're about 25 feet over here. So it's about 300 feet to the middle of the cul-de-sac. Thank you. Uh, Steve, one more question. Was this plan, uh, I'm not sure this is the one, Steve, but I got in late. Um, did we have to have the surveyor sign this plan? Was that yes. This plan? Yeah, the surveyor, the surveyor will endorse the final version of the plan, yes. Tom Hardman is the surveyor of record for the project. Uh, so once the board is comfortable with the plan, 
we'll be generating mylars that will get recorded, um, as well as um, having him endorse the existing conditions plan uh, for the project. And the DPW is now okay with all this because I know that uh, I think you we got that plan in from DPW late or their comments late on October third. So uh, you're telling me that uh, Paul is is happy with this plan now. I, I met with Paul on Friday. Um, like I said, I spent about an hour and a half at his office uh, going over the changes we made and some of the the other additional minor modifications. Like I said, he wants us to eliminate one catch basin make this a double catch basin. He had a couple of other minor calculation revisions that he wanted me to make um, that kind of conflict with the subdivision regs, but we agreed that we would do the stormwater regulation version versus the subdivision. And all that does is it moves our analysis point down to this stone wall where your subdivision regulations say we should be doing our analysis up to the limit of work. So I had done our original calculations up to this point Paul asked that we extend the limit of calculations to this point, had absolutely no difference in the sizing of our drainage mitigation plan. Uh, he still has to do a final review of that, but I, I don't anticipate any other changes at this point. Thank you. All right, very good. Um, before we go any further, uh, just gotta ask if there's anyone here from the public that would have any, because this is a continued public hearing. Anyone from the public? Okay, I'm not seeing any input. Uh, DCTV, if you see anyone, please let me know. Mr. Okay. Chair, I do not see anybody. There. there are no comments either. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, very good. So uh, the board, do I have any? Uh, well, it, it seems like uh, there, there's a, a lot of things that we need to have tied down here um, that have already been, it sounds like they've already been agreed to, but really need to be reflected in a final version of the plan. Um, and and I'm, I'm not too keen on... Uh, uh, burning a lot of the the time for our um, uh, contractor that we're using right now is the the town planner. Um, so I, I'm I'm hesitating on on uh, approving this administratively, and I also have uh, I, I have to take the consideration of the fire chief. Uh, he's got he's you know that this is his area of specialty, and and um, he's got some real concerns. Of, apparently about uh, a cistern. Um, I mean, do these do these cisterns come in different sizes, Steve, or is there a less expensive one than, than or are they just all the same? You, well, again, to be effective, you, you need at least, I believe you need about a 5,000 gallon capacity on the tank. Mm -hmm. um, you, again, it's, then you need the, obviously the hose connection. Um, and again, it does it does get pricey as you're putting in these these systems. And the owner did do some price checking to see if we could back it into the project budget. Um, and uh, he didn't feel comfortable that that would work for the economics, given it's only seven lots. But again, I I can't speak to the economics of how the project works because I don't know all of the numbers that he's working with. So it's tough for me to to give you more information than that. Um, Again, we'll defer to the board at this point. If the majority of the board feels we should add the cistern, then obviously we will have to do that. Um, I, I'd go back to that there is no either state, federal, or local regulation mandating it. And um, but again, we'll we'll defer to you guys. Did Did you reach out to uh, the chief? Uh, when the chief posted his initial comments on the portal, the town portal, I did respond to his initial comments. I don't believe I've seen a follow-up uh, from the chief, but there may be, but I did not see that. Um, but I did respond to the initial and explain, I gave him the explanation as to why we felt um, we really couldn't uh, put that in on this particular project, but because at least to us, there's an indication that he's uh, reiterated his uh, his concerns. 
So this, Kevin, this is the first time any subdivision, OSRD or other, has th this comment has even popped up. Okay. I've never, um, in my time on the board, never had any request for any such um, cistern being installed anywhere on any of the other developments. Um, I don't know, uh, John, I know is here. I don't know, John, if that's common um, when you were here. I don't or... recall that, um, but probably because there is no regulation on the book requiring it. Correct. Like in other towns, I can tell Correct. you, um, that I've worked in or currently work in, there is some requirement when there is no public water available to either put in these underground tanks, sprinkle a home, or I've even seen in some other towns a requirement to put money towards a tanker truck for a fire department. I believe that's in Rehoboth, but namely the cistern is the um, preferred alternative for a lot of fire chiefs and it's indicated as such in subdivision regulation. So maybe something to consider going forward. Yeah, th this definitely would be the first in the town of Dartmouth that I'm aware of. Um, Mr. Chair, so, a comment if I yes. could? Yes. Um, so I'm in full transparency. I'm a little bit on the fence on the cistern piece because I'm trying to come to grips with what is a nice to have or a should have versus a need to have. Um, because I, I certainly could see the value of doing it, but given that there's no, you know, written regulation requiring it, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm battling from two sides. Um, uh, and I'm wondering if there's some information that's out there for best practice when it comes to subdivisions such as ours, where a cistern begins to make sense to help this board, um, guide itself on a recommendation. And maybe that's an open-ended question. Uh, but, well, the the, I mean that that's more a question for our long-term planning, because again, it is not part of our subdivision rules. Um, my fear or my problem with, with saying, okay, we demand a cistern uh, on this one is we didn't for the last one, we didn't for the one before that. Why are we all of a sudden saying this? Um, and are we sure we're not going to forget it on the next one? Because it seems like that would be picking and choosing. So um, to me, that would be a good solution or, or something for us as a board to discuss for our bylaws and for our priority list. You know, if this is, got, if this is new technology or growing concern for the fire chiefs, we should be aware of it and we should change the bylaws and moving forward, it's in black and white, um, not thrown in, in the final 10 yards. Well, Mr. Chairman, as you well remember and, and know, um, I kind of got uh, assigned to try and find out a lot more about these cisterns. And so in that course, and I know it's not part of the subdivision, I did speak to Ms. Uh, Chief Turcott and Rick Aruda, Chief Aruda from District 3. So District 2 and 3, uh, Chief Aruda has volunteered to help me in any way he can because he believes that he needs these in his part of town too. So it may not be in our subdivisions now, but uh, our rules now, but I am really going to try to push this uh, for our spring meeting that it does get on our subdivision rules because what happens, uh, Kevin, is nobody takes care of the woods when the trees fall and things happen. You would get all that logs that become such a fire that in certain parts of town, if we ever had a major forest fire, we could not put it out. So that's the, that's the one of the problems to consider, okay? And as far as, um, I'm gonna address what Kevin Esty said, um, I'm not comfortable doing any kind of administrative uh, letting someone sign this because we don't have a planner yet. So I personally like to see the plan all set so that we can, all of us can sign the plan when it's complete. Okay. Very good. 
Uh, just any on other that, questions? Just on that note, uh, Margaret, you don't need to wait for the Springtown meeting. Subdivision regulations can be updated by the board with a public hearing at any time you wish, just as long as it's properly advertised. So oh, you can do it you. as soon as, you know, next month if you wanted to advertise for it. But obviously you want to properly vet that with your fire chiefs. Okay. Thank you, John, because that's Thanks. what I'm working on now. Very good. Okay. Um, Steve, do you feel that in two weeks you can have everything finalized to be signed off on or will it take a little e longer? No, I've actually already made all the revisions that Paul and I discussed on Friday. There, I brought them over to my CAD operator this afternoon, so he is in the process of making the changes. They may be ready as early as tomorrow. Uh, so, no, if if the board is not comfortable voting at this point, with two week continuing should work just fine. Okay. Um, what I think the board, what I would like to see the board do, and and again, it's I'm only one of five. I would like to close this public hearing and continue the administrative site plan review uh, until two weeks, if that makes sense. Uh, I'll make a motion to uh, close the public hearing and um, uh, continue the, the site plan review for this uh, OSRD in for uh, two more weeks. Very good. I have a motion by Kevin Estes. I'll second. Second by Margaret Sweet. All in favor, Kevin Estes? Yes. Margaret Sweet? Yes. Nick Cyclopatis? Yes. Helio Rosa? Yes. Kevin Mello? Yes. Okay. Very good, sure. Steve. We'll see you in two weeks. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Bye. Okay, we have a continued public hearing next for application for a special permit, 413 State Road. Do we have anyone here for this? Yes, uh, Peter Cruz from Cab Engineering, um, representing uh, the, the applicant for uh, 413 State Road. Um, we're looking to continue this to uh, uh, the next hearing. Uh, we're working through uh, some of the uh, DPW uh, stormwater comments. And also um, we did redesign the, the site to uh, accommodate all 13 parking spots on the site, um, which we're uh, in the process of updating all the plans. Uh, so that we can present the the new redesign to to the board and public uh, at the uh, next meeting. Okay. Um, what's the board? Anyone? Uh, I'll yeah. I'll need a motion in a second. Uh, I'll, oh. I'll move to continue uh, this application for uh, until the next uh, next meeting. Two weeks. Thank you. Have we don't have any deadlines or anything coming up for either this or the prior. Uh, Ross, John, how how are we doing for our? We're fine if they're asking for a continuance, correct? Okay. 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 So I have a motion by. Uh, I'll let the record show that Ross uh, acknowledged by nodding his head. Yeah, uh, confirmed. Confirmed. <laughs> Thank you, Ross. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, um. Kevin, I'll second. So, and Helio Rose is second. So all in favor, Kevin Estes? Yes. Helio Rosa? Yes. Myra Sweet? Yes. Nick Cyclopatis? Yes. Kevin Mello? Yes. Thank you. Peter Thank you so much. Have a good evening. You Thank too. you. So that takes care of administrative item, uh, site plan review. We uh, should also vote on a... Well, when in doubt, vote. So if I could have a motion in a second to continue administrative item number one for two weeks. Motion um, moved. Second. Okay, motion made by Nick Cyclopatis, second by Margaret Sweet. Nick Cyclopatis? Yes. Margaret Sweet? Yes. Kevin Estes? Yes. Helio Rosa? Yes. Kevin Mello? Yes. Okay. That brings us to our appointment 
with the Historical Commission. Good night, everybody. And there we are. Yes, a little bit of an echo, but you're here. Horrible Hard echo over here. here. Oh, uh -huh. it really is an echo. <laughs> Maybe, Maybe tech, tech support, support will come in from DCTV. Your, your microphone is probably feeding into your computer. Yeah. Mm. yeah. How about that? Yes. It's much That's better. Good. Very good. Okay, there we go. He didn't tell me that part. Okay, hi, I'm Chris Sewell from the Historic Commission, and uh, we're here tonight to share a little bit about the updated um, archaeological reconnaissance survey and how we hope that maybe the planning board could use the information from it to um, inform some of their decision making and work with us to preserve the historic and prehistoric remains in town. Uh, in case you want to get a, a fuller picture of what we received from the public archaeology lab who did the survey, we do have a link on our website to the presentation that was done by Holly Herbster, who, who did the survey. Um, so if you want to see her presentation, it's on um, a YouTube link, and it was, um, you know, it's kind of condensed version. It's a PowerPoint presentation, so there's a lot more visuals and if this isn't enough for you, there's more there. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. I've got two different things that I wanted to show you tonight. One is the survey itself, which we have in draft form that was delivered to us. And we have it in paper form as well, but there's some sensitive, some archaeological sensitivity maps that are not uh, for public consumption uh, to prevent looting and other destruction of the uh, archaeological remains. So I believe the planning board does have one copy of that. The Historic Commission has a copy, but what you'll be seeing tonight does not have those sensitivity maps. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to share the screen. Yes. With some technical support. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Where's my word document? Oh, okay, so I can open that one. Yeah, so right now they're going to see it on the screen. Okay. So open your word document. And... All right. Sorry, the, the technical support just left, and what I had to show you was bookmarked. I don't see it because the Zoom meeting's on top of it. All right, I'm just going to go straight to the sections of the um, reconnaissance survey that I pulled out so that I could um, talk to you a little bit about what we hope to do with you in the future and how the planning board could be involved. So we got this updated survey. We first had it done in 2002 before I was here and it was updated this year and some new sites were found, both historic and prehistoric. And the way it could be used, not only for us, but also for our planning board and conservation and zoning um, is to decide whether or not to approve a project or impose some conditions that would avoid, minimize and mitigate adverse effects to cultural resources. So by using the maps that we were given with this survey, um, you could overlay that on top of whatever new uh, project was coming down the pike and see what kind of resources could be impacted. Uh, there are different levels of sensitivity on the maps um, and they're also divided into which ones are prehistoric I mean, before con the contact period when colonists settled here and contact period, which is historic um, up until present day. And uh, so I've, I pulled a couple of sections from the survey itself uh, and 
the um, last section is about the conclusions and recommendations that Holly Herbster presented to us about how the survey could be used. And the first paragraph under that, the DHC could develop more formal liaisons with the planning department and conservation commission that could include review of the updated archeological sensitivity maps as part of their oversight with input from the DHC and as necessary from the Mass Historical um, Commission for those projects that fall within archeologically sensitive areas. Uh, one of the driving forces behind the um, reasons why we wanted the survey done right now is because between climate change and development, there have been a lot more areas within Dartmouth that are impacted. And we realize that there are a lot of movements and organizations that are dedicated to preserving open space. But for the um, areas which are open to being developed, those areas often have archeological resources. Many of those are not above ground. Um, especially native sites. We have burial grounds that are unmarked. Um, there are uh, areas where native people may have camped and moved seasonal grounds. There's shell middens, things that might not necessarily be on the ground like a foundation or a stone <laughs> wall, which we also are concerned with preserving but I just wanted to highlight some of those more ephemeral ones that um, might be not something you could observe on the surface and somebody wouldn't come across and say, oh, hey, you know, we have this uh, subdivision going in and there are a bunch of stone walls. What can we do to preserve those? So the, I divided this into a couple of different sections, what to protect Native American sites, we have archeological materials in Dartmouth spanning more than 10,000 years of history, which are present obviously in other towns. We also have historic period sites and um, those, there were several new ones in the updated survey, but the homes and farmsteads that are visible on the surface here uh, have not been fully investigated. And so not only are there the farm, sites that you can see left, but they there may have been more structures, outbuildings, um, fields with stone walls, ponds, dams, and mills that were part of those farmsteads. And so we'd like to make sure that those are, are protected and um, considered when new projects are being planned for Dartmouth. The role of state and local agencies is highlighted in the report. Uh, the state agency projects, usually there's a, there's a project notification form that goes to the Mass Historical Commission. And anytime there's a DOT project or anything like that, we also get notified. But as far as local projects go, the planning board is often the first, first stop, if you will. Um, so the, we wanted to highlight the fact that the MHC is available uh, as well as as the Dartmouth Historical Commission to offer technical assistance anytime that we want more information about what kind of resources might be within a project area. And uh, local regulations, those mechanisms can address proposed impacts to privately owned property when proposed projects require local government review or approval. Kind of, uh, as a tangent to that, we are looking to perhaps institute an uh, additional bylaw. Currently, we have a demolition delay bylaw, which I'm sure you're familiar with for historic structures. But uh, many towns have enacted either full or partial bylaws that are addressing the archaeological material that I've just been describing. So in this document, which I would like to forward to you in order to save some time, I've listed a few of the towns that were in the, listed in the archaeological survey who have done this type of work. And perhaps we could work with the planning board to develop these as well. Acton has one passed in 2022. I think that was the most recent one. 
Um, it was enacted for the purpose of surveying and documenting archeologically significant features and resources within the town prior to large areas of land disturbance of currently undisturbed land in archeologically sensitive areas. So I highlight the undisturbed land because not every town chose to only focus on undisturbed land. Aquina in particular, um, their bylaw applies to construction on developed and undeveloped lots, including any engineering and geotechnical studies such as perk tests, well drilling, utility trenching, demolition, road construction, clearing, excavation, and use of heavy machinery. So you can see it really runs a spectrum from, you know, you've got an open field that somebody wants to develop or house lots like the seven lot um, proposal you were just discussing to using heavy machinery in an area that's been developed already, but where sensitive materials might be found. So I won't take up too much of your time in going through the other towns and their various bylaws, but um, I think suffice it to say that we'd like to move in a direction to work with other organizations in town to try to preserve and protect what is under the ground and what is above ground. It is not necessarily a historic structure that's a house, a building, a barn. Um, there we are rich in historic and prehistoric resources here, and we'd like to do our best to work with you to preserve those. If there are others on the commission who'd like to add anything, I don't want to be the only one who said anything. If they have Would any, you like to no, if they have any questions? Okay. Do you have anything you'd like to add before? No. Okay. Are there any questions? Anyone from the board have a question? I have one quick question, if I can. Does yes. the, did the historic commission do they have a definition on the report of what archaeologically um significant or sensitive is? I would need to go back into the report and see if there was a particular definition of that. My quick answer is, I believe there is, yes. And okay. you do have a, a copy of the report, but I can get back to you on that and highlight it if you'd like. Thank you. Anyone else from the board? Okay. Um, well, I, I think, uh, thank you for I coming. Have, I have a question. I'm sorry. I oh, was on okay. mute. Christine, uh, I have a question. If someone is um, doing an approval not required from their land, from their law, uh, how would they know if there is an historical something buried in the ground or something? Is there going to be a uh, an overlay on the maps? How How would somebody know this? That's what the sensitivity maps that were designed to do. So they are not uh, visible to the public, but we have a copy and the planning board has a copy. And so if you got the application, then you could go to the survey and look at the map overlay and say, oh, this property is in an archeologically sensitive area for pre-contact remains. Or maybe you'll look at it and say, oh, this has been previously disturbed land. It's been farmed. It's been plowed for generations. The likelihood that there are any remains there is slim. So the maps are designed to give you a first glimpse into whether there are likely any remains there. From then, uh, if it is a sensitive area, then you could um, call us and we could get in touch with the AMHC and they could send out our, an archeologist to do some further testing um, or to probably assess the likelihood of that particular property having remains on it. So you would be putting this basically in the planning board's lap to be the coordinator or administrator. No, 
we'd be happy to work with you on coordinating. It's just that you get the applications and we don't. So we don't know what's coming down the pike. You're the first place that they go to to get to apply for a development. So it wouldn't be the building commissioner? If it's not something that is being demolished, it's a historic structure, no. Because we only see things that come through the building department that are 75 years or older and are a built structure. If no, they I'm talking, are, I'm talking so, about land and you know subdivisions and you know usually people go in and talk to the building commissioner before, you know. Right, and and we would like to work with the building commissioner as well on this, but uh, we do not get that information if it's just land. So do you want to say yeah. something? Can I? Yeah, I can speak. Um, I'll give you an example why we're interested in creating this additional bylaw. Um, at one point, we were notified about a subdivision um, on Bakerville Road. When they started to do the site prep, they uncovered an old granite foundation. When I approached, I, maybe I should have come to you, but what I, what I did was I approached the developer and asked if I could go in, take measurements and photographs. Within two days, they had buried that foundation. From what little research I was able to do, it was the original, it was the foundation to the original Baker house. So, I mean, that's all buried now. So we don't have, we had no opportunity to, to do anything with that particular foundation. And that's why we need this additional bylaw to protect not only foundations, um, stone walls, I think, are um, they have very special protections, and but we don't have protection for wells or cisterns, uh, granite cisterns, barways, um, anything like that. Okay, so so I actually have a question. Um, with, with these sites being protected in. Uh, I understand why you would not want to, you know, have looters going out. How are we to protect the unsuspecting public right. of buying land? You know, somebody, right. landowners have land, they're putting mm -hmm. it for sale. It meets the setbacks. It meets the criteria to be developed. They go, they get a mortgage on that land. They do a construction loan and all of a sudden, we're pumping the brakes on them saying, no, you can't build there. Uh, that site once housed the Baker land, home. What can we do? I mean, first of all, I think the easiest thing for us, you know, our agenda gets posted. Our agenda is public knowledge. So if we put you on our list, may maybe, uh, or you check our agenda to see when we're having a subdivision come before us, um, that would solve the problem immediately. But um, how how can we both go forward helping you while we're also protecting the general public? I have well, another another comment, um, Kevin, going along okay. our lines, going along what you just said, okay, because we both deal with sales. Um, if if something comes before the planning board and we did do this by law, and we said to Joe, the buyer, well, I'm sorry, you can't buy this now, and Mr. Seller, you can't send your kid, uh, you can't give this law away to your child because it's uh, it's protected. Uh, there's something on there. That's almost like eminent domain. It's almost saying the town's going to take this property now because it's an historic site, which is fine as long as the town's going to pay for it. That's my question. I think that's an issue that has to be thought about before we do a bylaw on this. That's just my comment. We're not suggesting that 
the lot cannot be bought or sold. We're just looking to do the appropriate research and come up with a plan to either work it into the subdivision plan somehow. Um, I know that a lot of people that get into these stonewall bylaws don't like to see them moved, but in some cases they have allowed for the stones to be used in landscaping that's been done in the subdivision. Um, if it's a well that was of particularly interesting construction, that can all be uh, covered in a respectful way, and meaning, and, and I don't mean covered and unseen, but for example, in Europe, they put a piece of thick plate glass over features like that. They don't erase them. And I think that's what we're looking to do. We're not looking to stop the development. We're just looking for the opportunity to inspect and document. And I know that that should be all part of the subdivision plan, but if you recall the property off Hathaway Road, where they submitted a, a plan, luckily for, I guess, for us and for the town, the, someone had the, the original survey included the location of a stone wall, which led us to find additional stone features on the property, which we would have never done had they not included that information. I, if I can also, I think the, the idea of the bylaw, if a person were to buy a particular piece of land and find a feature, perhaps we could work with the landowner so that the house was um, put on a site slightly to the side of that feature so it wasn't destroyed. Or at least we could document it before it was destroyed. Those kinds of things. We're not trying to stop development or stop homeowners from having choice. But if we could mitigate damage and mitigate destruction, that's really what we're trying to do. Okay. Um, Kev, uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, yes. if I might. Um, I, I just wanted to make a, a, another comment that's uh, that that I, I think is, is you know, we're, we're talking about all of these applications coming to us. Uh, we don't see every application. Uh, sometimes an application might go to the, the building department and then go to the Zoning Board of Appeals, in which case, by the time it gets to us, it's kind of pretty, the, the ball's pretty far, far down the field. Uh, so if, if you're thinking about uh, us being a stopgap, uh, that we we may not be your perfect stopgap. I I think we were starting with the planning board, and we would yeah. also do the conservation and zoning and the building department as well. We'd yeah. like it to be a townwide, you know, a, a municipal effort for Dartmouth. And if we could all be on the same page, or you know, making sure that everybody knows <clears throat> what's coming down that would be the most helpful route to go. We don't want you to be the gatekeepers. We would like all of all of these boards to work together. So there, there's no way to map these and put these out. You, you feel this valuable that would be destroyed or removed or stolen. Um, yeah, I, I guess. Okay. Information. There are people who would go out and say, "Oh, this there was a native site here. I'm going to go out and try to get anything that's on the ground, and maybe I'll do some digging and see if there's a burial." That happens. Okay. So they're they're closely held, but they're not entirely private which is why you have a copy. Okay. Um, so are you going to prepare the, the bylaw that you would like? Um, what What is it you're asking for? 
we wanted to introduce the concept. Okay. To you. We wanted to introduce you to the archaeological reconnaissance survey and the draft form um, is available without the sensitivity maps to everybody. And then also, as I mentioned, the the um, YouTube video of Holly's presentation, I think would be really important to look at so you can see what kind of resources we're talking about. But then we plan to um, present this to the other boards and to work to draft a bylaw for archaeological resources. Can I okay. share a few comments, Chairman? Sure. Um, I, I appreciate everything that's been presented. And to be transparent with you, I'm trying to process it both in how it's being presented, perhaps what it means to me and what it may or may not mean to a existing landowner and or a buyer and or a developer. And I'm hoping that your bylaw, if it comes before us or if we have any insight or you know, able to share further thoughts, I'm hoping that your effort, which is grossly respected, and I do respect it, but I also don't think it should be at the disservice of an existing landowner, seller, buyer, or developer for anything that is subsurface. I understand it is of value historically if it's identified. I'm just hoping that your presentation and bylaw will take into consideration perhaps time, time that the Historical Commission will be granted to excavate, locate, attempt to preserve, remove from the property, but that time be deemed reasonable in any court so that a buyer, a seller, or a developer can proceed with their lives. So I just want to share the fact that I'm on board with your thoughts, but I want to respect the existing landowner, the potential landowner, and the builder. And I, I think those have to be part of the equation because if they're not, it's going to be hard to support it. I understand what you're saying, and I think our existing bylaw that gives a six month window um, for us to work with a homeowner, uh, if it's a significant historic building, they have six months and, and we can go in if we can work with the homeowner to document the house, um, do 3D video measurements, um, or, um, to, to catalog all the important features. But the, at the end of that time, it's back to the homeowner and we're, we, we can't go beyond that six month deadline to try to keep somebody from tearing down their house, even if it is historically significant. I, th I think, um, I just wanna to add to this. I appreciate you clarifying that. I think your language in terms of a lot of the amount of time for the historical commission to take action and or exercise their rights based on any bylaw, it needs to be somewhat consistent perhaps with any financing contingency and so on. Six months is a long time to hold up a piece of property that might be willing to transact or close within 90 days. So for things that are subsurface and or there's financing and dates and deadlines, I'm hoping that maybe you folks can think about how to condense your effort, have your resources in place, that if such property is under agreement, that you too have to perform within a certain amount of time. Outside of a transaction, I understand you may be granted six months for different purposes, but not to hold up the legal transaction and or permitting and or building. I just think there's gonna be a balance between the commission doing what it should do from an archeological perspective, but not be a burden to the buyer, the seller or the proposed developer, that's all. And I think within reason, you know, I think it can be met. I have one more thought, uh, listening to, to, to my uh, colleague. Um, you talk about the sensitivity maps that you've done. Uh, you're asking a bylaw to be written or uh, supported by the planning board when we have no idea on those sensitivity maps. I mean, how much land does this actually cover? I mean, I'm not comfortable voting for something that I haven't seen and that I have no knowledge of so I think that if you're, if you're gonna ask the planning board to support you, uh, you know, we have to have a little more information on the lot coverage that you're talking about. I mean, it could be, you know, could be a lot of lots in Dartmouth, a lot of property, a lot of farms. And how are we to know if we can't see it? 
Understood. Uh, we we have copies. We are happy to share them in an appropriate space and time. They just can't be out there for public consumption. So they, Margaret, there's a copy in the town planner's office. The update. Okay. So you have access to it. You just can't take it home. Well, I don't it's like. like it. I just want to see what's covered. Right. And it's the first I heard of it, uh, Susan. So I didn't know that. Uh, just, just to get an idea here, like let's say, for instance, my property is on the sensitivity list. Um, it, well, what is the likelihood, based on based on the, the the study that was done, what is the likelihood that there's going to be something in my property that is uh, uh, worthy of of historical preservation or uh, reclamation. I think that's something that we'd have to look at uh, on a property by property basis, but we could look at your location. We could put the maps on overlay on top. We could consult with historic maps. Um, we have a series of those. We could look at uh, previous deeds and see what the likelihood is. We could bring in MHC to see if they had any other resources we could coordinate those efforts with you to see what the likelihood is. If the, if the land that, if your property has been disturbed over and over and over again, even if it's in a sensitive area, the likelihood of finding something significant on your property is fairly low. If you are in a property where it's the first time that anything has ever been built there and it's in the sensitive area on the coast, um, and it kind of hits a bunch of bullets for a high likelihood, then that's something we can share with you and maybe maybe work with you to allow some test pits to be done or um, uh, field walking to be done just to see if there's anything on the surface. So those kinds of things are ground penetrating ra radar. There are a lot of um, a lot of resources out there that would not be horribly intrusive or time consuming that would give you that information. Okay. Thank you. I applaud okay. the efforts. I, I I just have you know they're they're obviously just like the my fellow board members. We've got some concerns about uh, encumbering a, a a piece of property from either being transferred or uh, any action taken on that property unnecessarily. I think one of the things that all of us have in our mind is when you drive down the road and you see those signs attached to telephone poles that say, we buy stone walls. No, it just makes my stomach turn. And I think we're all kind of thinking about what's out there and what we don't want to lose that gives our town character that can't be replaced. And, you know, that's an important resource to all of us and balance that with homeowners' rights. And I think that we can just do a little bit more than we're already doing. That's so as a as a general rule, um, like the subdivision earlier today, anytime stone walls are being disturbed, they do have to re-establish them on the property. That has been uh, the policy of this board in my tenure here, and it continues, including this particular development where those stone walls are either incorporated in as boundary lines or if they are in the way, they have to be relocated somewhere within the development itself, which not as good as the original, obviously, but um, it it does help sustain the character of the area. Can I ask another question, Mr. Chair? Sure. Um, for the commission, will the bylaw and or yeah, perhaps the bylaw, will there be language especially in anything outside of a commercial zone where there may not be a 21E during any transaction in or financing, will it free the landowner from any and all findings that you may fall, find in your effort in soil samples to look for historical artifacts? Is there a burden to the landowner or is they gonna be relieved of such burden based on your effort and will it be clear before you approach and or touch the property? 
a lot of these historical, a lot of these historical, let's just say sites, um, were likely not heated by natural gas. Um, I'm not implying there's oil in the soil, but it wouldn't be fair to a landowner to let you have access for your purposes and then be told that their sample had X percent of X and we need you to do this now. Or am I out of scope asking for such immunity to the landowner, but I think somebody has to. I don't think it's something that we have gotten far enough down the road in trying to craft a bylaw to have considered yet. So we'll take your comments and um, consider them as we move forward. Thank you. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, I'm not seeing any further comments. Someone has a hand up. The Diane Gilbert. Okay. She might be muted. Is that an uh, error? Are you willing to recognize me? <laughs> uh, Will you put your hand up? You've got your yes, hand up. I so. would like to speak. Uh, I tuned into this Zoom meeting, which I'm happy uh, to have been a witness to. Uh, but I think, I mean, I used to be on the Historical Commission in two different stints. I'm no longer on the Historical Commission, so I don't speak for the Historical Commission. I just speak as a resident and a taxpayer in town who cares about our historic resources. Uh, I might argue that uh, this meeting with the Historical Commission, getting into the weeds of what this bylaw is about is a bit premature. Uh, I can understand there's a lot of skepticism about, oh, oh my God, another bylaw. Oh my God, another law that's going to tell the owners what they can do with their property. I get all that. Except that I would basically start out by advising you all that you should also take into consideration when you make your deliberations uh, the importance of the town of Dartmouth, its character, its integrity, its resources, seen and unseen. I mean, if you want to start off with, oh my God, this bylaw, which I haven't seen yet, is going to destroy the freedoms of the homeowners. I would just urge you to step back because I think part of what the commission is doing tonight it is basically to gather information from the experts on the planning board uh, to enable the commission with other departments and other consultants, whoever they bring in, uh, to be better informed about the concerns, but also end up with an, a product that We'll pass town meeting, quite frankly. <laughs> so nobody wants to get into this losing uh, the battle on something that if everybody understood how important this was and how it could be a win-win for the town and for the homeowners, then, you know, that's the direction that I hope people, uh, or at least the perception that people have tonight. Because I think this is, this will, uh, this has a long way to go. And as was stated by the commission, they want to visit, you know, they've been working with the building department. So revisit the building department vis-a-vis -vis this particular situation or bylaw potentially. Con -com, DPW, other, you know, other organizations. So I think I, I, I just want to end by saying, please have an open mind. There are a lot of myths and realities with respect to bylaws like this. And so let's wait and see what can be put together with your help uh, to do something that 
at the end of the day protects the town's integrity and cultural assets and makes a place, uh, continues to, for Dartmouth to be a place where everybody wants to live. Because part of that is Dartmouth's history. Thank you for letting me speak. You're welcome. Very good. Um, anybody else? All right, very good. I'd like to thank the um, Historical Commission for coming today. Um, I hope you've gotten some input that will help you. Um, please uh, feel free to share your drafts with us. We can give you some further input as you move along. And uh, we will be vetting the and doing the public hearing for any such uh, bylaw when the time comes. Thank you for having us. And thank you. Encourage Thank you. Please go on the website and check out the presentation by Holly Herbster of the reconnaissance survey. It's not terribly long, and I think it'll fill in some gaps for you. Very Thank good. You. Thank you. Okay. Um, site plan review for 68 Old Fall River Road. Ross? Uh, yes. The applicant contacted the planning office and informed me that uh, they are requesting to be continued to the next meeting as they work through um, some of the comments from reviewing departments. Okay, very good. Motion move made on. to move 68 Old Fall River Road to the next meeting. I have a motion by Nick Cyclopatis. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Kevin Estes. All in favor, Nick Cyclopatis. Yes. Kevin Estes? Yes. Margaret Sweet? Yes. Helio Rosa? Yes. Kevin Mello? Yes. Approval not required. One stone ledge road. Okay. Uh, this plan is for reconfiguration of map 123, lot 266 into two lots. Um, lot one has existing house on it already and has frontage on stone ledge road. Lot two does not appear to have frontage at this time. Um, there's a section of Stone Ledge Road that is not built that I've included a aerial view in your packet that you can kind of see. Um, and I believe the uh, engineer of this project is still on uh, if you want to take over here. Hi, uh, good evening for the record again, Steve Giosa. And I can share my screen if uh, yes, that's please. appropriate. Okay, so we have a parcel of land, um, about 40,000 square feet in total area, uh, fronting on Stone Ledge Road. Stone Ledge Road is here, and as uh, Ross indicated, it is actually constructed uh, in two directions, both in front of this portion of the property here uh, on this side of the site, um, and then also up to our boundary line on this edge of the site. So there's a gap in the middle here where the road has not been uh, developed, but it was laid out back in a included in our application. I think it was back in the 1920s or 1930s. Um, the road actually was modified and this kink in the road was created. Um, and so it is a layout that has existed um, since before subdivision control in the town of Dartmouth. Um, but this last section just was never completed. The goal is to isolate the existing house and garage on lot number one. Lot one would have 124 feet of frontage on stone ledge, 17,000 square feet. Lot two would have um, a total frontage, well, it's, it's kind of broken up here, but let's see, a total frontage of um, eight plus 158. So a little over 165 feet, 166 feet of frontage and 22,000 square feet of area. There's a former garage located on the, the remaining land. We have set the new lot line dividing the two parcels to meet the setbacks from these structures. 
And uh, so the goal is to create this lot. It is registered land, so it would have to go to land court to get finalized. And as Ross indicated, we would have to also, before we could get a building permit to build a new structure, we would need to get a section of stone ledge constructed uh, to a line and grade um, that is acceptable to the town for serving whatever the purpose of this lot ends up being. It would obviously be uh, either a single family or a duplex uh, construction. The lot is large enough to support the duplex in the general residence uh, zoning district. Um, so we're looking for endorsement of the plan, which would allow us to go to land court. Um, at which point we would then work through getting a road improvement plan uh, submitted to the planning board and the DPW for review. And that would have to precede the application for any building permit since we don't have uh, a road improved in front. There are utilities. Sanitary sewer runs all the way through here and the water line runs all the way through here. So there already are utilities in this section of Stone Ledge. It's just the paved surface was never constructed. Our thought is that we would extend the piece of stone ledge in this area here uh, to serve this particular lot. But again, that's something that we would have to do in order to get a building permit uh, for lot two. Lot one obviously already has a uh, occupancy permit and we're not diminishing any of its access or frontage on the improved section of stone ledge road with this plant. So that's what we're asking for this evening. And okay, very good. Um, any questions from the board? Uh, I have a question, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, is, is it really an A and R if the frontage that is uh, shown on the map really is not? developed street frontage if there's no street there yes it is because it, it's it, past practice it, it always has been um they're asking us to subdivide the lot yeah and i can i can go into a, an example we did a lot recently recently within the last couple of years on Patton Avenue or Patton Street, which runs off of Slocum Road, almost opposite the town hall. And it was the exact same situation. We we have a lot that was created. There was no improved roadway. We did have to present a plan showing uh, how the road would be improved. In that case, uh, we ended up going with a gravel road extension that was approved by the board and by the uh, DPW. Uh, to serve the lot, but that was an independent process. We would have to do the same thing here, is to get a road improvement plan as a separate application. But because the layout of the road already exists, it does not fall under the subdivision control law. If Stone Ledge did not already exist and it didn't exist prior to subdivision control, then I think you are correct. We would have to go through a definitive subdivision process to create the right-of-way, but the right-of-way exists. Um, and it has existed for 100 years. And all that remains is to get the improvements approved before we can get a building permit. So signing the plan or endorsing the plan gets us moving with land court and allows us to move forward, but does not allow us to go for a building permit, which is why we put the note on the plan. The above endorsement is not a determination as to conformance with zoning regulations. We need that improved frontage to comply with the regulations. Well, Steve, um, you know, as well as I, you can subdivide a piece of land as many times as you want, as long right. as you can make it buildable. But right. I know on Patton Street, because I remembered that, and I, I, I didn't particularly care for the way that was done because it was a gravel road, if I remember correctly. But on this one here, you have actually, what, you're at, what you have is frontage on a paper street, really. Stone that that part of Stone Ledge is a paper street, correct? Yeah, it's a street that's been laid out, but it's not improved, right. correct? But it's yes. a paper street, okay. right? Yeah. So, um, if you want approval not required, as long as you put non-buildable, 
on lot two, which you would have to do. Correct? No. no. I, I don't agree. No. Um, it does, it I meets the other standards. We do not. The planning board does not meet does not dis determine whether or not this lot is a buildable lot or not a buildable lot, which is again, why we put this note in the planning board signature box, which is a requirement uh, when there's any question whether or not the lots are buildable or not. That's the protection everybody has on this particular lot. We cannot move forward with an application for a building permit until we have a road improvement plan approved by this board. Just so you know, we're not looking for a gravel road in this case. This will be a paved road because the last time this was done, there was a, I think it was actually over here, there was a paved extension to service, I think, this lot here. Uh, that's the last extension that occurred on, on Stone Ledge. But no, I do not agree that you would have to note that this is a non-buildable lot. It meets frontage and area requirement. That's all you're making a determination on at this time. And the determination buildability goes to the building department at this point. Another question, when you say you're going to bring uh, pavement to lot two, um, what do you, uh, 50 feet? Is that what you're thinking? Because that's what's required? Well, we, we would do what is required by both this board and the DPW. That's really where it's going to fall, as it did with Patton Street, is how much did we have to build? Is it 50 feet? Is 100 feet of frontage what you folks are going to look for? We won't know that until we provide you with a proposal and you respond to it. Um, my feeling is the less pavement, the better. Um, you want to have adequate improvement to serve the lot. But if you were to bring 50 feet of pavement in and a driveway on this side of the lot, you know, I would argue that that's adequate access to safely uh, access this particular lot. You as a board may decide that we need to bring more road in. I, I can't answer that at this point. I think you'll need to see the detail of that uh, design before you can make that determination. Steve, we also had a case uh, recently on Arnold. Was that you, Steve? Did you? Do yeah, Arnold that was Street? me as well. Yes, Arnold. She was exactly the same thing. Yes, we it, just it, did that a year and a half or so ago. The house has now been built. We ended up doing a paved road extension in that case, uh, with a little gravel drainage basin at the at the end of the roadway that just filters some of the runoff. But yeah, that was a very similar situation on Arnold Street. Correct. But didn't we make you pave that street? You made us pave that street, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, paved the road with Cape Cod berms on either side. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I, if I may, just looking down into the future, then um, I know this area very well. Uh, the, there are the the top of the top section of Stone Ledge. Uh, that, that you can't see on this map is at a very high elevation. Uh, and there's a lot of runoff on Sunset, which parallels Stone Ledge and creates quite a problem for uh, the lower properties, including runoff right into the uh, Buzzards Bay uh, down by the Anthony Beach area. And creates a lot of problems with uh, with flooding. Um, this property here, the break in that road. Uh, if you're going to pave that, you're going to increase runoff from the top section of Stone Ledge down into the bottom section, uh, and that that could be problematic. Yeah. So the goal would not be to bridge the entire connection. Um, obviously, the developer would prefer not to do that. Um, cost and, as you just pointed out, additional impervious surface that really would serve no purpose. I think the people on the lower section, I'll, I'll refer to the east side as the lower section because it does drop to the east. Um, they don't want an interconnection here. Uh, I'm sure they would prefer, especially these homes at the end, to make sure this does not become a, a more... Uh, cut through type uh, access way past their homes. So 
we would anticipate that a short extension of this road would be required and some form of drainage mitigation will be required by the DPW. What form that'll take, we need to look at the topography and what the options may be. But my guess is some filter strips on either side, shed the runoff, create possibly some um, bioretention on either side. And that for a short section of road extension is probably an appropriate uh, mitigation measure. But we're, we're gonna look to minimize the paved surface, but we're also gonna have to satisfy the stormwater regulations of the town. And you do now have stormwater regulations enforced by DPW, and this would definitely be subject to it. Okay. So any other questions on the matter before us, not future matters? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Could I have a motion? Okay, no motions from the board. Mr. Chair, can I just make a comment for yeah. my edification here? I'm just looking at um, uh, the subdivision bylaws and section one criteria, and I'm just not sure that we've met the criteria for this ANR, particularly uh, because that that portion of the of the street is not that has not been the past practice of this board, including uh, other properties before us. Question for you, Steve. If you, if you Steve, do you also, if you can yeah. hear me. If you if you can clarify for this board under section one um, of all the criteria, section one dot one oh one A through D, where we've met the criteria for planning board approval not required. Well, you have me at a disadvantage where I don't have those in front of me, but if you give me a minute, let me see if I can get them on another computer here. While Steve's doing that, can I make a comment, Mr. Chair? Yes, please. Um, I remember Arnold Street. It was one of the first presentations when I became uh, a board member. Understanding the nature of Mr. Giosa's uh, presentation tonight and the fact that they can't proceed until there is pavement and that comes before us, what precludes it from being voted on as an ANR under that circumstance? Where, where are we having trouble? I, I'm not really sure. This is the first time in my tenure that, you know, it, approval is not required, meaning they really don't need our approval. You know, I don't know about the land court issue. Um, we generally never really debate this um, right. when it's not required because all we're doing is allowing them to file in court that subject law A is owned by right. person X and law B is owned by person Z, and sure. that is all we're doing. It's never my, my point is been debated to this point because it's not re it's yeah. not required. But it has been point, on an approved it, street. It, it's it's been applied as an approval, not required. Yeah. So again, I would go back to and I think the Section 1.101C, there is a private street in existence before April 7th, 1953. This is a private street. It was, it was created, I found the layout plan, 1926. It was originally Sherman Street, and it is now Stone Ledge. There was a layout plan endorsed by, and I didn't realize the town had this, but the Town of Dartmouth Board of Survey on June 9th, 1926. I did include that in the filing, so it is on the portal um, because I thought this question might come up um, because what they did was they put that kink in the road that you saw that goes past this particular lot. Here, Sherman Street was originally a straight roadway. So the Board of Survey for the town of Dartmouth, and again, this is the first plan, and I talked to Tom Ardman about this, 
he had never heard of the Board of Survey acting in the town of Dartmouth. It's more of like the city of New Bedford had a Board of Survey uh, doing these types of layouts. But this way has existed since 1926. The town has felt that it existed in such a form that they extended both sewer and water past the frontage of both lots one and two. So there are utilities, municipal utilities within the way past the lot. Now it's just a question of getting approval from you in a subsequent filing for a road improvement plan. We've always done it this way in town where we would do a road improvement plan. It's a separate application. I don't even think you have a standard application. We would just file it. It would be reviewed by this board and DPW. And if we had conservation involvement, conservation would review it. Um, but there's no conservation involvement here. So that's been the process we've gone through in town, especially on these ways that were laid out, which is similar to Patton Street and similar to Arnold Street. Um, those were ways previously laid out but never improved. We came back after the lots were created to um, improve Get, get approval so we could build on the lot. As of right now, by you signing this plan and with that notation on the plan, we're not entitled to a building permit. And obviously that's that's where we'll stand until we get a road improvement plan approved. Mr. Chair, can yes. I make a comment? Yes. I just wanna share with my fellow board members that I wanna be cautious. And, and let, me, let me just state this first. I'm, I'm making a motion that we move this as an ANR. And I want to be cautious, similar to the cistern conversation based on that project presented as the cistern um, came to the top. It's something we need to work on. It's something we need to take into consideration. And obviously, my tenure here is little, but I understand perhaps paper, old, 1923, these dates and historical streets, rather, they're not paved or what are they? have to come to surface so that this doesn't happen in the future. But I would hate to hold something that's consistent today with perhaps what we voted on then and in the past, a couple of years ago, Arnold Street, knowing that he has to come before us with a road improvement plan. So that's my position on this project. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion by Nick Cyclopatis to endorse the ANR. Do I have a second? Okay. Unfortunately, Mr. Gioso, we do not have an endorsement of this ANR because I cannot endorse it myself. Um, comment? Excuse me? Can I make a comment? Yes. Uh, just going back to the subdivision regulations, I think from, from my view of it, I'm not in any way um, have any issue with lot one and in, in meeting it. Um, but just going back to 1.101 subsection C, um, the, it's obviously the street has been in existence since before 1953. It's whether or not in the opinion of this board, if the existing street is of sufficient width, suitable grade, and construction to provide adequate access and municipal services to every lot, in this case, lot two. As of which the year, municipal services are already there in the lot he's already acknowledging that he has to get the road permit. So I, I don't see your points. Like I said, my point is the municipal services are there. Is the, is the frontage, is the street of sufficient with suitable grade and construction? He I don't stated know. that he needs, he needs to get that, that step two. You can't put the cart in front of the horse. The horses pull the cart. We need to allow the ANR so that he can move on to step two. I feel like I'm in a catch twenty two. I, I, I need feel, one I before I can get the other. I need the other before I can get the one. Well, in all fairness, I, I'm I'm perplexed as to, and I and I and I'm happy to learn. I'm perplexed as to why some would, would expend monies and effort to get a road improvement plan when they're not certain if they're going to get the subdivision they need to put the road improvement plan road, road improvement plan in place. I, I, I'm not sure I'm not sure what we're losing as a board or as a town by making a motion to approve this 
knowing what he has ahead of him before he can actually build. Right? I'm under the impression the only thing we're doing tonight is allowing him to draw new lines. And then he has another project, a road improvement project, before a developer can go and build a house for them. That's how I see it. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And I'm only one member. Um, I don't think you're wrong, Nick. I just think, and in and, and respect to uh, our chair, um, just because something was done before doesn't make it right and doesn't mean this board's got to continue carrying that that uh, on. Um, I feel that uh, we could do an approval not required, but to me, that lot two is not buildable because it's not on a approved street. If I if I may, Mr. Chairman, yes, please. Um, if it helps move the the hearing along and the meeting along, um, if we agree to add that particular note that Margaret is suggesting to the plan, I, I don't think it's necessary, but let's put it on the plan. I would put the note that says um, lot two is not buildable until such time as um, road improvement plan is approved by the planning board. That way there is not a document on record that says it's not a buildable lot, black and white period, and we have to come back for some mod modification. It gives a little bit more information than just, it's not a buildable lot. It's not buildable until such time as we have an approved road improvement plan, which you folks have to approve, and then it would become a buildable lot. Now that would take that issue maybe off the table for the board members who are a little uncomfortable, um, and maybe allow a motion to go forward with the condition that that note be added to the plan. Um, because we've got to go to land court. Land court's about a six month to eight month process. And during that six to eight month process, we would anticipate coming back before you with the road improvement plan. So by the time we finish with land court, we'll have the road improvement plan approved and we're ready to move forward. So that's kind of the thought process. Um, and um, I think the applicant would be agreeable to that if that solves that particular problem for some of the board members. Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, given what Steve had just mentioned, I would endorse that. And my other comment was my only criteria is to make sure that this board meets the um, written requirements of what qualifies as the A&R. Given Mr. Gios's um, proposal, I could endorse that. I okay. agree with Helio. Uh, once Steve puts that on the plan, then I'm happy with it too, uh, because it needs to be put on the plan. Okay. So uh, we will have that added to the plan. We have a motion by Nick Cyclopatis to approve it. Uh, Helio. He has to amend that. Oh, Kevin, he has to amend uh, So I'm, I make a motion that we approve the plan as presented tonight by Mr. Gioso with his most recent comment that he will add to the plan that the property is not considered a buildable lot until a subsequent plan for road improvement has been approved. Okay. Awesome. Motion made. Second by Helio Rosa. All in favor? Nick Cyclopatis? Yes. Helio Rosa? Yes. Kevin Estes? Yes. Myra Sweet? Yes. Kevin Mello? Yes. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Steve. Like, I, like, I like to have you have a nice, interesting evening. So um, nothing simple. To, nothing <laughs> simple for me. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm leaving you now. <laughs> Dwayne signed his deal. So we, we've got nothing else to worry about. <laughs> yeah, we got a goalie. Uh, good night now. <laughs> good night. <laughs> okay. Now, agenda number five. Release of lots from Performance Covenant, Hanover Court, Lot 14. Ross, why don't you fill in the board on this one? Yeah. So recently we had a law office contact the the planning office about a lot release. Um, I actually worked with the uh, high school intern with this project uh, who's been helping out in the planning office. We looked through the folder for Hanover Court and actually found the release document for lot 14, which is the lot in question from the April 19th, 1988 meeting. Uh, the issue was it was just never recorded and the registry would not take an attested copy and they don't seem to have the original. 
So it was, it's in the minutes, it's on the agenda. I have the actual document, it's in your packet, it's just a copy. So in order for this law to actually formally be released and be recorded, there needs to just be a new form with today's board's signature, if that makes sense. That's an easy one, Ross. <laughs> yes, it is. This one's an easy one. I make a motion to approve uh, that we do a new, uh, what would you call it, uh, Ross? A new letter? A, a release, the, release of lots. A release. So mm -hmm. I, I make a motion that we do a new release of lots because the one that was done in 1988, no one can find it, I guess, at the registry. And it certainly was signed by our plan, well, not our planning board, but it, the planning board at the time of document. So I would make that motion that uh, to allow. Okay, we have a motion by Margaret Sweet. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Nick Cyclopatis. All in favor, Margaret Sweet? Yes. Nick Cyclopatis? Yes. Kevin Estes? Yes. Helio Rosa? Yes. Kevin Mello? Yes. Okay. Number six, release of lots from performance covenants, Bakerville Vineyards. Okay. Uh, so at this point, they're requesting map 110, lot 157 1, and map 34, lots 2, 2 2, and 2 3 to be released at this time. Uh, it is from the seven lot definitive subdivision entitled Bakerville Vineyards. Um, the DPW estimated a surety amount, and we have received that amount via an a, a acceptable letter of credit. So we have an acceptable form of surety at this time, which would be uh, a requirement to have these lots released at this time. Okay, questions? Okay, action. Make, I make a motion. To approve. Oh, go ahead. Margaret, Margaret first. No, no, Nick, go ahead. Make a motion okay. to approve the release of lots in number six for Bakerville Vineyards. Okay, we have a motion by Nick Cyclopatis. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second by Margaret Sweet. All in favor? Nick Cyclopatis? Yes. Margaret Sweet? Yes. Kevin Estes? Yes. Helio Rosa? Yes. And Kevin Mello? Yes. Correspondence, Town of Freetown, City of New Bedford, and Town of Westport. Okay, any questions on any of these? Um, it, if I, in our packet, there seems to be one more. I think you I may guess. have skipped over the minutes, Kevin. Okay, we can go back to that one. Oh, um, nope. uh, there's a release right. of lots from performance cover in three Hanover Court. We did that one before. Okay. That's the 1988 one. Oh, all right. The one we I did skip so, over right. minutes, but since we're on correspondence, let's. Uh, but I didn't. Yeah, okay. I didn't recognize three Hanover Court. Yeah, right. that that's okay. Uh, any questions on correspondence? Since we're on that, we have a letter, um, Mr. Chair, to the planning board. Did you see that? Um. As part of the correspondence. Yes, did you see it? Yeah. What do we do with with the, that letter? <laughs> um, Be nice. <laughs> I mean, should this have come before? Will this come before next? I mean, will it be on the next meeting that we have pertaining to that property? Um. It, it's Ross. Any I, thoughts? I can any... include it in in the packet portion for that property uh, when it's on the next meeting, um, and it can get uh, spoken into the record um, at that meeting, or it can be discussed at that meeting at that time. Um, I had to include it with this one just because it did get continued from the previous, so. I will just continue that same information from this packet to the next. So if you put it in, in the packet 
for that particular property. Yes, I will be sure not to do that. Dan. Is John still here? Uh, no, he is okay. not here. Okay, all right. So I think I, that's fine if you just put it in. What do you think, Kevin, and my board members? That That's fine, yeah. It should be part of the public record for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, part of the public record. Instead of just the correspondence. I right. mean, anyone can send us a letter about anything at any time. Keep right. that in mind. Um, right. And we that this is where we put it. Um, if you want it to be part of that, when we're discussing the property, sure, that's fine. Well, I think it has to be because it addresses that particular property. Right, and we didn't address it today, right. so that we're good. Okay. Okay. So Ross will move it in with that property then. Thank um, you. So acknowledge and file. Yeah, I make a motion to acknowledge and file. Okay. Second. Margaret made a motion. And who was the second? Second. Kevin. Kevin Estes. Uh, all in favor? Margaret Sweet? Yes. Kevin Estes? Yes. Nick Cyclopatis? Yes. Helio Rosa? Yes. And Kevin Mello? Yes. Uh, so minutes of September 23rd. Make a motion to approve. I have a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Second uh, motion made by Margaret Sweet. Second by Nick Cyclopatis. All in favor? Margaret Sweet? Yes. Nick Cyclopatis? Yes. Kevin Estes? Yes. Helio Rosa? Yes. Kevin Mello? Yes. Okay. Uh, new business, uh, for your information, old business, new business, Zone and Board of Appeals. Any questions on the ZBA or anything from uh, subcommittee reports? Anyone have subcommittees, any meetings? I have one tomorrow. Um, in addition to the consult, the uh, planner, or is that the one you're referring to? No, I'm uh, uh, community preservation. Community, okay, okay. So it looks like there's no subcommittee reports. Um, planner's report. Um, I put a draft priority list based on our conversation at the 23rd meeting um, in your packet. So if any of you have any comments about that or any revisions you'd like me to make, um, you can always reach out to me to do so. I just wanted to update you that I've moved that draft letter along based off what we talked about on the 23rd. So I think there's got to be um, two things that I can think of right now. Uh, okay. One is I think we should eliminate number four, the infill development, because the more I've researched what the governor is proposing is exactly what I had in mind. Oh, so okay. okay. I guess great minds think alike. Right. <laughs> um, Kevin for governor? <laughs> hey, well, no, I don't know. Um, I, I'm, I'm good, thanks. Um, let's see, and then in, in, in its place, we should put Margaret's, um, what Margaret's working on about the, um, you, and you have it number three, so you have cistern. Okay. So I think we should just shorten it because it really, what, what the governor did really is what I had envisioned. So uh, there's good. really no need to hit it from both sides. Deal. That's it for me. Okay, uh, nothing for master plan implementation or planning department. Um, you have the consultant update, the hours which we have to vote on. Yep, yep, that should be the last page in your packet. Mm -hmm. So um, you see the hours uh, that need to be approved right now. We approved seven hours on 9-9. We approved five hours on 9-23. Mm -hmm. And we are looking to have three hours approved today. Motion, so, motion that we approve those hours. Okay. I have a motion by Nick Cyclopatis, second by Kevin Estes. All in favor, Nick Cyclopatis? 
Yes. Kevin Estes. Yes. Margaret Sweet. Yes. Helio Rosa. Yes. Kevin Mello. Yes. Um, so we are, uh, as far as my report, we are well underneath uh, our allowed time with our consultant. We are meeting tomorrow. Uh, the, what time, um, Kevin? I didn't have that down. I have 930 down. Okay, I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's which kind of um the technical reviewer meeting the technical reviewer is, is that another 10? thing that we need to talk about um because margaret and i have down that we're meeting at 9 30. um i i don't have a sense of what time frame it would be you know one of margaret or i will be there we could go to the tech it's the same room but i don't know if we're going to be done in time ross um mm -hmm. does chris vitale normally go to the technical reviewers meetings y yes when he, when he's available to yes okay so it's not all the time no no he's on the invitation list but when he can he does Okay. Um please see the dot yeah, uh 930 in room 305. So oh, I don't know. Oh, so that's a different room than technical reviewer. Okay. So not sure what to say, guys. You know, I don't Kevin, if, if you're available, would you like to go? Um if not, Margaret or I could go after. Uh, I am looking at like 10 o'clock, right? Correct. There's only yeah. one presentation tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, I can, I'll go. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry. It's just. No, that's all right. With the, I mean, as, as Kevin, Kevin said, we're, we're there, but sometimes they're done and sometimes it takes an hour. So we don't know. Right. Mr. Chair? Yes. How does um, this board designate who attends the technical review meetings? We really, it's- We just um, did. We just did. <laughs> you witnessed it. Very cool. Um, in general, <laughs> when we have a town planner, we weren't really going. We actually were criticized right. um, for mm -hmm. being there. In the absence of a town planner full time, I requested that one of us be allowed to go to this reviewers meeting to represent the, the board along with Ross, um, which the selectmen, the select board allowed and said yes. So um, let them criticize people. Uh, we, we have the endorsement of the select board um, to be there. So if people don't like it, so sorry, so sad. Um, we have just been trying to just who can go, when they can go, who's around, who's not around. So anytime you're available to go to one, please speak up. We'd love to have you go. Okay. I am not available tomorrow, but um, for future technical reviews, I will make myself um, at the disposal yep. of the board. So um, Ross generally sends out, okay, we have a meeting. They do get canceled often. Obviously, mm -hmm. if nobody tomorrow, there's only one item. If that person backs out, it could be canceled. Um, the other thing too is as Ross sends out um, emails to, to the board in general, I'd like it to be common practice not to reply all. It's We've discussed this. Um, it kind of is okay not to, you know, if it's certain items, um, but we get into habits. And if we reply all and it's something that could be considered as a consensus, we could be in trouble and violation of open meeting laws, which I take seriously. Um, so please let's just get in the habit of not replying all, just reply to Ross when you get a chance. Um, so the, the last thing that I need to mention is that 
there was um, a joint meeting executive session with the select board that we did not have officially today. Um, unfortunately, um, I was unaware of the proper way to post this meeting and we are supposed to adjourn, meet, adjourn, go to the open meeting, executive session, executive, yeah. and uh, then recess and come back to our regular meeting. Um, this is actually, uh, I believe, the first time that this has ever come up because we don't go into executive session with the select board ever that I remember. Um, but Kevin, that would have been hard to do anyway because our meeting didn't start till seven. And it wasn't as a Zoom meeting. So it would have been difficult. Correct, correct. Um, but, it, you know, we would have had to figure something out. You know, we would have had to work through it. Um, so we will have an executive session uh, with Attorney Savistano or Brian Cruz coming up possibly our next um, meeting in two weeks um, to discuss the matter and it will be properly posted and um, it won't be an open meeting violation. So um, you guys, please uh, look forward to that in two weeks. <laughs> Starting early. Um, well, we, no. we, will, we will work that out with Attorney Savistano or, or Brian Cruz, whichever is going to do the presentation to us. Um, and it will be posted properly. So um, we, we, we can work with that because it's not a joint meeting. Right. So we don't, have to, we don't have to start early. We can start at seven. Or no, the, the select board meets pretty regularly in executive session. And they do that prior to their meeting started. In right. their meeting, I correct me if I'm wrong, Ross or, or um, Margaret, they start at six o'clock? I believe so. 30. Oh, it's not 6.30? Maybe, maybe six, 6.30. They start earlier than us. I know. Okay. So that's, that, that's why their executive session starts at five, right. um, which is difficult for most of us. Um, so I don't think uh, Attorney mm -hmm. Savistano will need to come in, you know, have us come in at five o'clock and have a literally 10 minute meeting and then have two hours to right. gap. So we will work and Ross, you'll probably get that phone call tomorrow. So no please problem. arrange that. And if you can make it 645 or, or seven o'clock and then make our next meeting start, there's no law that says we have to start at seven o'clock. If we post it for seven fifteen, okay. I don't know. I don't know how DCTV will need to be aware of that. You know, work that in because they obviously have to shut the cameras off for public, mm. but not for us. Um, and uh, the other thing that we should think about is there's growing concerns about the fact that we still meet on zoom so i don't know how that the the board feels but um i know the governor said it was until march of 25 mm -hmm. i believe um yep. i don't know if how the board feels about ending that sooner we never really uh normally we regroup after we have a new board and we never have continued that on um Kevin, are you implying that it's been frowned upon that we're still in a zoom session that is the rumor that i have heard yes Interesting. i have not i have not been officially asked which is one way and i certainly have not been told because my tone would be very different right now if i was told what we had to do Look, I'm, I'm not convinced our productivity or our ability to collaborate will be any differently, but um, if, you know, if, if we're the outcast because everyone else is going to town hall and, and we're not, perhaps that's, you know, perhaps that's something we have to decide. I, I think we got the Zoom down pretty well, and I think that uh, 
we have public participation because of the Zoom meetings. I think a lot of people tune in to the Zoom meetings, as you can see, and, and I think a lot of people like it. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm, I don't care. Whatever the board decides, I'm fine with it, it it's um I'm not asking for anything now. I'm just planting no, the seed no. and I'm yeah. just passing on what I've what I've been hearing. So um, uh, I, I want to make a closing statement to that. If we technically have until March, it's only going to get darker earlier. It's only going to get colder. It's only going to get icier and rainier. There's no reason for some people to leave town hall at nine or nine thirty and drive, you know, out to South Dartmouth or near the Westport line in the dead of winter when we have the right to do this through March. Perhaps we take that into consideration. Our productivity is no less than what it would be. Uh, I, Not only that, I, I think, you know, it, it's, and, and I know we're, we're going beyond the, the concept of March here, but it's hard enough to fill board seats for a town. To make it easier, we should exercise our, our, our right to, uh, you know, I mean, we're obviously locked and loaded with with a full board now, but uh, you know, I, I think we should we should continue this uh, as long as possible, if for no other reason than to to show that uh, it 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 can be easier than traveling in and out. Agreed. Well, I kind of I kind of agree because in the middle of winter, you know, I I don't know where everybody lives, but I live good twenty minutes from the town hall. You are probably the furthest one away. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, I appreciate what Nick said about uh, snow and ice because that's what I'm driving, you know, when I'm coming out at 930 at night, 10 o'clock, and it's a bad night. But again, I will do whatever the board wants. And I'll make my own comment on that. Um, Mr. Chair, you're, you haven't asked for anything. Uh, I am in support of your leadership on this. Okay. Well, we will, um, when it comes to light, we'll bring it back to you guys and I'll present it the way it gets presented to me. If it does. Okay. If, if I not, know Kevin, he asked the person that frowned upon this, if they're pulling papers in April. <laughs> no. <laughs> two terms, people, two terms. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I'm not saying I wouldn't, go to a different board, but you know, that's a different story. <laughs> so um, anything else, anyone? All right, very good. Um, last item, last uh, motion. Motion to adjourn, please. Thank you, Kevin. Second. I will second. Thank you, Helio. So we have a motion to adjourn, Kevin Estes. Yes. Ilya Rosa. Yes. Margaret Sweet. Yes. Nick Cyclopatis. Yes. And I just want to add, Helio, you beat me by a second. I was about to call you out and tell you that you want to participate on this vote. <laughs> I I feel like I have to beg for motions these days. I don't know. <laughs> you know. Just this so, me. Just this me. Just this one. Just this one. All right. You can let the record show. You, you'll notice we we all we voted unanimously. Yeah. <laughs> we and we always do, don't we?